Good morning, first graders. Happy Wednesday. Uh, today we're going to go over our morning message, some calendar activities, and then in math, we're going to just keep practicing clocks and being able to tell what the hour is and what the minutes are using hour and half hour. So let's get started. I hope that you are actually having a really awesome and wonderful Wednesday. Remember how I sent that big envelope? If you still have not sent it to me, that's okay. But remember, you still have time. I know I wanted it back by yesterday, and if you haven't sent it or had time to do it, that's okay. Um, but go ahead and try to get it done this week and send it over to me so that I can put together our animal habitats book that we were creating before distance learning started. All right, if you have any questions, remember just call, email me, whatever you need to do on Seesaw. Anyway, you can contact me and I'll help you with your questions or if you just wanna talk and, and say hello. I missed you all very much, so I love hearing from you. Let's get started. Good morning, first graders. Today is Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. I miss you so much. Today you will learn to read and tell time by the hour and half hour. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Love, Mrs. Roche. Yesterday was Tuesday. Today is Wednesday. Tomorrow will be Thursday. Now for the weather, I've just been kind of predicting what I think the weather might be looking like based off what it looks like outside. So today I think it's going to be sunny. Not so much windy, not so much cold, but just kind of sunny and hopefully that makes it warm. So I'm just gonna put it both on sunny today. A penny is one, a nickel is five, a dime is 10 and a quarter's 25. Remember, boys and girls, if you find coins at home, you can practice counting them so that you can get really good at counting your money coins because when you're older, you might be using them and need to know how to count. So you can practice that at any time. Today, we're gonna continue talking about clocks. Now, I know we've talked a lot about clocks. We've talked about how clocks could be on our wrists. We've talked about how clocks can be on our cell phones or your parents' cell phones. They can be in the in the house and an alarm clock, on the wall, in our kitchen. You could see clocks at school. And sometimes when you're at different places, they have clocks in the rooms that you are in. Clocks are everywhere, so it's just really important that we learn how to read them. If you look at my board here, I have an analog clock and a digital clock. Now, when you are asked to tell the hour and you see that the long hand, which is my blue hand here, is um, pointing to the 12, that means it's o'clock. And for o'clock, we use two zeros because that shows us that it's at the zero minute part of the clock where it's the clock minutes start over after an hour. And you can see that my shorthand is pointing to the eight. But if I erase my long hand and I moved it to be pointing to the six, that's going to change my minutes. It's no longer gonna be zero, zero because it's gone half way around the clock. So it's not hour anymore, it's half. It's half an hour or halfway around the clock. And if there are 60 minutes in a whole clock all the way around, half of 60 is 30. And one way that you can always figure out the minutes is by counting by fives. Every time you go around the clock, you practice saying five, 10, 15, and keep going, and whatever number you land on and whatever number you think in your brain or say out loud, that's your minutes. So listen to how I do that. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So I noticed my long hand is pointing to the six, and I ended on 30, so that's my minutes. 
Whenever your long hand is pointing to a number, that tells you your minutes, and you count by fives. Whenever your short hand is pointing to a number, that's your hour. So I could even switch my hour here. Before, it was pointing to between the eight and the nine. But what if I put it here? It's not a long hand, so it's gonna tell me my hours, and it's kind of in between the one and the two. And the rule is, if it's in the middle of the numbers, you go back. Do you know what number it is? What's the hour? If you said it is 1.30, you are correct. Now what I want you to do is get out your math book and find the page that we're going to be working on today so that we can practice reading our analog and digital clocks and practice writing the time. Today we're going to learn how to tell the time to the hour and the half hour. We've been practicing, so now we're going to see if you can practice writing the numbers digitally and on our analog clock. A class went to the library at 1.30. Look at these clocks. Find the analog and digital clock on the picture and make the clocks show the time 1.30 on the analog and 1.30 on the digital. You'll write the hands and the numbers. Okay, now look at my clock. My short hand is red and it's in between the one and the two. That tells me the hour is one. My long hand, which is blue, is pointing on top of the six, which shows the minutes 30, making my clock say one thirty. Do that to yours. Now on our digital clock, we want it to say one thirty-two. So with a digital clock, we just write the numbers. The hour would be one, and the minutes would be 30 because that's the half hour. And now when we look at the clock, it reads 1.30. Go ahead and make sure that your watch says the same thing as mine. Look at the clocks that are in the yellow. Now you can tell the time to the hour and the half hour. What you do is you start at the 60 or the 12 and you go around the clock. Remember, one hour is 60 minutes long. And when that long hand is pointing to the 12, that means 60 minutes have gone by. And it starts over at 00. zero. So the hour would say 9 and the minutes would say 00. zero. It is 9 o'clock. But if we go to the next clock and 30 minutes have gone by halfway around the clock, now it says 930. Look a little closer. Do you see how only half of the clock is shaded? One half hour is 30 minutes long. When it goes halfway around the clock, we use the number 30. Remember, we count by fives to go around our clock. And you can see the clock says 930 now. So now we know that we can use clocks to help us. So now what I want us to learn how to do is draw the minute hand to show the time and write the time on the digital clock. You can see that in problem one, it's telling you the digital time is 1130, but you need to write it on the digital clock. So in the yellow box where the arrow is pointing down to, I want you to go ahead and write 1130. But on the clock, I want you to draw the long hand, which should be pointing to the 30. Now both my digital clock and analog say the same exact time. My long hand is pointing to the six, which makes it halfway around the clock, which makes 30 minutes. For problem two, it says half past five. They drew the hour hand for you, but they need you to do the minutes. So you need to write 530 and draw the hand. Okay, it's time for some more practice. Draw the minute hand to show the time and write the time in the digital clock. If you look at all the problems, it shows you two clocks. The analog, which is the one with the short hand and long hand, and the digital, which is the one that you'll use numbers. It'll tell you a time or you'll have to read the numbers to know what to write. So look at problem three. Next to it, it says 330. Make your clock say 3.30 on both digital and analog. 
problem four. Make these two clocks read nine o'clock. Remember, o'clock means the minutes are zero, zero. Problem five, half past one. Here's your hint. When you hear the word half past, that means 30 minutes or halfway around the clock. Draw your lines and numbers. Problem six. It says eight o'clock. Make your digital clock read eight o'clock with numbers and your analog clock make your long hand point to the 12 for o'clock. Problem seven says write half past two on the clock. You have to think about what half past means. It means half past the clock, halfway around. Write your number. Problem eight. Write six o'clock on the clock. Use your numbers. The hour hand is between the one and the two. The minute hand is on the six. What time is it? Draw the hands on the clock. So you need to write the short hand and the long hand in, in the right spots and then write the time digitally. The time on the clock is one hour after two o'clock. What time is it? Write the time and maybe explain your answer to a family member. Two plus one makes what? How many minutes, do you see how I circled that? How many minutes after the hour does this clock show? Write the number on the line. Remember, what is halfway around the clock? All right, boys and girls, we finished our chapter yesterday about uh, Wilbur getting Charlotte's baby egg sack um, back home. And so I'm gonna read our last chapter today. It's called A Warm Wind. And so Wilbur came home to his beloved manure pile in the barn cellar. His was a strange homecoming. Around his neck he wore a medal of honor. In his mouth he held a sack of spiders. Spider eggs. There is no place like home, Wilbur thought. As he placed Charlotte's 514 unborn children carefully in a safe corner, the barn smelled good. His friends, the sheep and the geese, were glad to see him back. These geese gave him a noisy welcome. Congratulations, they cried. Nice work. Mr. Zuckerman took the medal from Wilbur's neck and hung it on a nail over the pig pen, where visitors would examine it. Wilbur himself could look at it whenever he wanted to. In the days that followed, he was very happy. He grew to a great size. He no longer worried about being killed, for he knew that Mr. Zuckerman would keep him as a long time as he lived. Wilbur often thought of Charlotte. A few strands of her old web still hung in the doorway, and every day Wilbur would stand and look at the torn empty web and a lump would come into his throat. No one ever had such a good friend, so affectionate, loyal, and skillful. Well, the autumn days grew shorter and Lurvy brought the squashes and pumpkins in from the garden and piled them in the barn floor where they wouldn't get nipped and frosted on frosted nights. The maples and birches churned bright colors and the wind shook them and they dropped their leaves one by one to the ground. Under the wild apple trees in the pasture, the red little apples lay thick on the ground and the sheep not on them and the geese not on them and the foxes at night, they sniffed them. One evening, just before Christmas, the snow began to fall. It covered the house and barn and fields and woods. Wilbur had never seen snow before. When morning came, he went out and plowed the drifts in his yard for fun, for just the fun of it. Fern and Avery arrived dragging a sled. They coasted down the lane and out onto the frozen pond in the pasture. These are bringing lots of memories of going outside in our snow and um, this winter when we would be able to do those things around Christmas time. Coasting is the most fun there is, said Avery. The most fun there is, retorted Fern. The most fun there's 
there is is when uh, the Ferris wheel stops and Henry and I are in the top car and Henry makes the car swing. And we can see everything for miles and miles and miles. Oh, goodness. Are you still thinking about that old Ferris wheel, Fern? The fair was weeks and weeks ago. I think about it all the time, said Fern, picking the snow from her ear. After Christmas, the thermometer dropped to 10 below zero. Brr. Cold settled onto the world and the pasture was bleak and frozen. The cows stayed in the barn all the time now, except on sunny mornings when they went out and stood in the barnyard in the lee of the straw pile. The sheep stayed near the barn, too, for protection. When they were thirsty, they ate snow. The geese hung around the barnyard the way boys hang around a store, and Mr. Zuckerman fed them corn and turnips just to keep them cheerful. Many, many thanks, they always said. Templeton moved indoors when winter came. His ratty home under the pig trough was too chilly, so he fixed himself a cozy nest in the barn behind the grain bins. He lined it with bits of dirty newspapers and rags, and whenever he found a trinket or a keepsake, he carried it home and stored it there. He continued to visit Wilbur three times a day. Wow. Every mealtime. And Wilbur kept his promise. Wilbur let the rat eat first. Then, when Templeton... Sorry. When Templeton couldn't hold another mouthful, that's when Wilbur would eat. And as a result of overeating, Templeton grew bigger and bigger and fatter and fatter than any ever rat you've ever saw. He was gigantic. He was as big as a young woodchuck almost. The old sheep took to him about his talked to him about his size one day. You would live longer if you ate less food, said the sheep. Psh, who wants to live forever? I am naturally a heavy eater, and I get untold satisfaction from the pleasures of the feast. He patted his stomach, grinned at the sheep, and crept upstairs to lie down. Here is Templeton. He's pretty big, huh? All winter, Wilbur watched over Charlotte's egg sack as though he were guarding his own children. He had scooped out a special place in the manure for the sack next to the barn fence, or the board fence. On cold nights, he laid next to it so his breath would warm it up. And for Wilbur, nothing in life was so important as this small, round object. Nothing else mattered. Patiently, he waited to the end of winter and the coming of the little spiders. Life is always a rich and steady time when you are waiting for something to happen or hatch. The winter ended at last. I heard the frogs today said the sheep. Listen, do you hear them now? Wilbur stood still and cocked his ears to the side. From the pond in thrill chorus came the voices of hundreds of little frogs. <gasps> Springtime, said the sheep. Another spring. As she walked away, Wilbur saw a new lamb following her. It was only a few hours old. The snows melted and ran away. The streams and ditches bubbled and chattered with the rushing water. A sparrow, which is a bird, with a streaky breast arrived and sang. The light strengthened. The morning came sooner. Almost every morning there was another new lamb. The goose was sitting on nine eggs. The sky seemed wider and warm wind blew. The last remaining strands of Charlotte's old web floated away and vanished. Well, one fine sunny day, morning after breakfast, Wilbur stood watching the precious sack. He wasn't thinking of anything much. As he stood there, he noticed something move. He stepped closer. A tiny spider crawled from the sack. It was no bigger than a grain of sand, no bigger than the head of a pin. Its body was gray with a black stripe underneath. Its legs were gray and tan, and it looked just like Charlotte. Wilbur trembled all over when he saw it. The little spider waved at him. Then Wilbur looked more closely. Then two more spiders crawled out and waved. They climbed round and round on the sack, exploring their new world. Then three more little spiders, then eight, then ten, then Charlotte's children were all here at last. 
Wilbur's heart pounded and he began to squeal and raced in circles, kicking manure into the air. Then he turned a backflip. Then he planted his front feet and came to a stop in front of Char Charlotte's children. Hello there, he said. The first spider said hello, but its voice was so small that Wilbur couldn't really hear it. I am an old friend of your mother's, said Wilbur. I'm glad to see you. Are you all right? Is everything all right? And the little spiders waved their four legs at him, and Wilbur could see that by the way that they acted that they were glad to see him too. Is there anything I can get you? Anything you need? Well, the young spiders just waved, and for several days and nights they crawled here and there and up and down, around and about, just waving at Wilbur, trailing tiny drag lines behind them and exploring their new home. There were dozens and dozens of them. Wilbur couldn't really count them, but he knew he had a lot of good and many new friends. They grew quite rapidly. That means they grew really fast. Soon each was as big as a BB shot. They made tiny webs near the sack. Then came a quiet morning when Zuckerman opened a door on the north side and a warm draft of air blew softly through the barn and the air smelled of the damp earth, spruce woods, sweet springtime. The baby spiders felt the warm updraft. One spider climbed to the top of the fence. Then it did something that came as a great surprise. The spider stood on its head, pointed its spinnerets in the air, and let loose a cloud of fine silk. The silk formed a balloon, and as Wilbur watched, the spider let go of the fence and rose into the air. Goodbye, it said as it sailed through the doorway. What? Wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? But the spider was already out of sight. Then another baby spider crawled to the top of the fence, stood its head, made a balloon, and sailed away. Then another, then another spider. The air was soon filled with so many tiny balloons, each balloon holding a spider. Wilbur was getting to be frantic. Charlotte's babies were disappearing at a great rate. Come back, children, come back, he cried. Goodbye, goodbye, they called. At last, one little spider took enough time to stop and talk to Wilbur before making its balloon. We're leaving here on the warm updraft. This is our moment for setting forth. We are spiders and we are going out into the world to make webs for ourselves. But where? asked Wilbur. Wherever the wind takes us, high, low, near, far, east, west, north, south, we take to the breeze, we go as we please. Are you all going? You can't all go. I'd be left alone with no friends. Your mother wouldn't want that to happen, I'm sure of it, said Wilbur. The air was now so full of balloonists that the barn cellar kind of looked almost as though a mist had gathered. Balloons by the dozen were rising and circling and drafting away through the door, sailing off on a gentle wind. Cries of goodbye came from uh, Wilbur's ear to Wilbur's ears. He couldn't bear to watch any more. So he sank to the ground and closed his eyes. This seemed like the end of the world to be deserted by Charlotte's children, and Wilbur started to cry himself to sleep. When he woke up late afternoon, he looked at the egg sack and it was empty. He looked into the air and the balloonists were gone. Then he walked drearily to the doorway where Charlotte's web used to be. He was standing there thinking of her when he heard a small voice. Salutations, it said. I'm up here. So am I, said another voice. So am I, said a third voice. Three of us are staying. We like this place and we like you. Wilbur looked up. At the top of the doorway, three small webs were being constructed and on each web, working busily, was one of Charlotte's daughters. Can I take this to mean that you are definitely deciding to live here in the barn cellar and that I'm going to have three friends? asked Wilbur. Yes, indeed, said the spider. What are your names, please? asked Wilbur, trembling with joy. So you can see that the spiders are up here and there's Wilbur, super excited. I'll tell you my name, replied the first little spider. I'm trembling with joy, said Wilbur. 
then that's my name. My name is Joy. What was my mother's middle initial? Asked the second spider. Mm, A, said Wilbur. Then my name is Arania, said the spider. How about me? Asked the third spider. Will you just pick out a nice, sensible name for me? You know, something not too long, not fancy, but, you know, just good. Wilbur thought hard. Nellie, he suggested. Fine, I like that very much, said the third spider. You may call me Nellie. She daintily fastened her orb line to the next spoke of the web. Wilbur's heart brimmed with happiness. He felt that he should make a, sh a short little speech on that very important occasion. Joy, Orania, and Nellie, welcome to the barn cellar. You have chosen a hollow doorway from which you're sh to string your webs. And I think it's only fair to tell you that I was devoted to your mother. I owe my very life to her. She was brilliant, beautiful, and loyal to the end. I shall always treasure her memory. So to you, her daughters, I pledge my friendship forever and ever. I pledge mine, said Joy. I do too, said Arania. And so do I, said Nellie, who had managed to catch a small nap. It was a happy day for Wilbur, and many more happy, tranquil days followed. As time went on and the months and years came and went, he was never without friends. Fern did not come regularly to the barn anymore because she was growing up and was careful to avoid childish things, but like sitting on a milk stool near a pig pen. But Charlotte's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, year after year, lived in the doorway. Each spring, there were new little spiders hatching out to take the place of the old ones. Most of them sailed away on their balloons, but there was always two or three that stayed. Mr. Zuckerman took fine care of Wilbur all the rest of his days, and the pig was often visited by friends and admirers, for nobody ever forgot the year of his triumph in the miracle of the web. Life in the barn was very good, night and day, winter and summer, spring and fall, dull days, bright days. It was the best place to be, thought Wilbur. This warm, delicious cellar with the geese, the changing seasons, the heat of the sun, the passage of the birds the nearness of the rats, the sameness of the sheep, the love of the spiders, and the smell of the manure. Honestly, the glory of everything. Wilbur never forgot Charlotte, and although he loved her children and grandchildren dearly, none of the new spiders ever quit. Never, the, let me try that again. None of the new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class by herself, it is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. The end. I really, really hope you enjoyed um, our story, Charlotte's Web, and that this year you really liked a lot of the read-alouds that we did. Stuart Little and Charlotte's Web, remember, are written by E.B. White. And um, you can find other books written by E.B. White by just looking maybe on YouTube, or if you're able to um, research those books online, maybe you can order them. Anyways, hope you liked it. Bye. Great job today practicing your clocks and being able to tell the hour and the minutes. Remember, the hour hand is short and the long hand or minute hand is long. That's going to always help you read a clock. Or if you know how to tell numbers, you can also read with the numbers on a digital clock. Have a great Wednesday, boys and girls. Remember to send me your animal habitat pictures and keep practicing your work. Work really hard. I know that we're getting a little tired. It's getting nicer outside and it's harder to do our work at home because it's not our normal classroom learning. But I wanna encourage you to keep working hard to keep trying to do your math and reading every single day for just a short amount of time so that your brains can keep learning and you can keep growing in school. All right, boys and girls, have a lovely day. I miss you and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.